So good afternoon and welcome to today's Transportation Reg Regulatory Update webinar. I'm Tommy Hogan, Manager of Transportation Account Management here at Higher Right, and we are thrilled to have Dave Oshecki from ATA join us. Before we get started, I have a couple housekeeping items I'd like to go over with you. This presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. If you're experiencing any audio or visual issues, please refresh your browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a bar with icons that control the various components of the webinar. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties that cannot be addressed through the help section, <clears throat> please let us know through the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And at the end of the presentation, we would appreciate getting your feedback by taking a short survey. So today's guest speakers are Dave Oshecki. Um, Mr. Rob Abbott actually had something come up at the last minute and is not going to be joining us today. Um, but a little bit about Dave. Dave is the Executive Vice President and Chief of National Advocacy for the American Trucking Association. Prior to promotion as Executive Vice President, Dave was the Senior Vice President of Policy and Regulatory Affairs, Vice President of Safety for ATA, and before that, Executive Director for the ATA Intermodal Conference. Dave is responsible for overseeing ATA's policy development and regulatory advocacy on a host of trucking issues including fuel, energy issues, environmental requirements, labor, safety, and security rules, as well as trucks <clears throat> size and weight limits. Dave is also responsible for managing his staff of policy and regulatory experts and is also called upon to represent ATA and the trucking industry at government hear hearings and industry events. So thank you, Dave, for being here today. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Tommy. I uh, appreciate the introduction, and uh, good afternoon to everyone who dialed in. We, uh, we ATA and Higher Right appreciate your involvement today. Um, before I go any further, uh, allow me to elaborate on, on uh, our missing Rob Abbott today. And many of you probably either know or know of Rob. He's our VP of uh, Safety Policy here at the American Trucking Associations. And Rob is uh, an integral member of the National Motor Carrier Safety Advisory Committee. That's an official advisory committee to uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration here in Washington, D.C. And, and Rob's on that committee. Um, FMCSA called a meeting just within the last 10 days or so of that committee, and Rob is participating in, in that committee meeting today. So he uh, sends his regards and sends his regrets. Uh, and, and I will miss Rob because I've always found that these webinars are, are perhaps a little better for the listener, for you all, uh, when there's some back and forth between uh, between speakers. So uh, I will certainly miss Rob, and I suspect you might too. But uh, having said that, let's uh, let's get into the, the, the webinar. Um, and at the outset, al allow me to, to thank Higher Right for the longstanding relationship that, that we have had at ATA with Higher Right. Um, it's, it's more than 30 years at this point, and we value the partnership and relationship that we have had and will continue to have. Um, in terms of, of today's webinar, we're going to focus on, on the regulatory arena. Uh, many of you know that at ATA we, we uh, advocate in both the legislative and, and uh, regulatory arenas as well as the, the legal arena. And when, when litigation is necessary, we uh, participate in that as well. But today we're just going to focus on um, mostly the topics that are listed on your screen. We're going to talk a little bit about the electronic logging device uh, rule. Uh, and whether anything stands in its way to, to full implementation uh, late next year. Uh, we'll delve into the entry-level driver training regulation and kind of where that is and where it may be going uh, later this year. And something that's been in the press a lot, uh, the safety fitness determination, or what a lot of people think of as a safety rating uh, rule, and uh, we're, we'll talk uh, a bit about that. And there is some new information for, for me to share with you all on that, uh, something I think many of you may find good news. Uh, the drug and alcohol clearinghouse regulation, uh, that's something that's been in the works for many, many, uh, many years. And uh, as you can see on the slide, is it still in a black hole? And the short answer is no. It's uh, shortly about ready to pop out of the black hole. So we'll talk about that. 
Uh, OSHA, uh, last month in May, published a new record-keeping uh, rule. It's an electronic record-keeping rule. We'll go through some of the details on that. And then we'll wrap up with the Department of Labor's uh, new overtime regulation that affects the white-collar exemption. Um, so those are the, the main topic areas. There's three or four other issues at the end of the webinar that I'll touch on uh, briefly before we get into the Q&A session. So uh, my expectation, uh, and I guess for, for, for your expectation, I'm going to try to get through the, the prepared slides and material in about, uh, my guess is 25 to 30 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Um, okay. Let's just uh, dive right in with the ELD rule. Uh, I'm sure uh, most or, or all of you know that uh, this rule has been a long time in coming. The, the actual regulation was published in December of 2015, so about six months ago. And it, it follows a, a congressional mandate, a congressional requirement that the DOT uh, publish this rule. That congressional mandate was in what's commonly referred to as MAP 21, uh, which is the highway bill from 2012. So the Congress told DOT and FMCSA to do this. It did take uh, FMCSA about two and a half years to get the rulemaking done. Um, and now that it's published, I, I, I do want to emphasize um, that it, it will cover a vast majority of the trucking industry, a vast majority of the trucks, but not all trucks, uh, because there is uh, an exception or an exemption in, in the rule, if you will. Uh, any driver that's required to fill out a paper logbook today will need ELDs under this rule. If the driver is not required to keep a paper logbook, in other words, the driver is operating under the, uh, the air mile radius exemption, uh, the local short haul exemption where they're exempted from the paper logbook, that driver would not need an ELD in the future. Uh, and there, there is sort of a threshold of, of several days if you're going back and forth between logs and, and uh, no logs under that exemption. But the effective date, as I alluded to earlier, is December of 2017, so a year and a half away, uh, is when this rule becomes fully effective for any driver in any truck that is required to have an ELD. And in terms of, of the, the trucks, uh, I already talked about the drivers. If the driver is required to log, is going to need an ELD. If uh, there is an, an exemption for trucks older than the year 2000, so any, any truck built since the year 2000 forward uh, will require this ELD if the driver needs it, but any, any truck that's older than that will not be required to have it. And, and the reason for that is it's, it's technological. It's technical in nature. Um, the, the ELD has to be tied into the engine, either wire uh, with wire or wirelessly, and the older trucks do not have that capability. So DOT and FMCSA did not feel as if they could uh, re require that of those older trucks. Now the rule is being challenged. This is sort of uh, this is the issue that that may uh, derail this, and I say may because it's not at all certain that it could derail the effective date of December 2017. But it is the rule is being challenged by the Owner Operators Independent Drivers Association. Uh, as some of you have probably read in the trade press, OIDA has stated very publicly and very clearly that they're going to throw every resource that they have at overturning this regulation. Uh, so they did file suit last, uh, last year when the, when the rule was published. They have already filed their first uh, briefing document, their, their set of arguments, if you will, with the court. Um, and there are, there are lots of arguments in the document that they filed, but there's really three main arguments. They, they are um, arguing that the rule violates a driver's privacy. Uh, they are arguing that the rule uh, still allows employers to harass drivers, you know, what they refer to as a, a driver harassment protection, and they don't think that the rule does enough to protect the, the driver harassment piece. And then they also question um, whether the ELD itself, the technology, meets the statute. And the statute, the MAP21 law that I mentioned earlier, requires that the, the device be automatic. And, and OIDA is making the argument to the court uh, and to the agency that the ELDs are not automatic because while they automatically capture driving time when the real wheels of the truck are moving, they do not automatically capture sleeper birth time and on-duty not driving time. The driver still has to provide some manual input, i.e. press a button on the, on the system uh, to train, change duties from driving time to, uh, to that other on-duty not driving time or sleeper birth time. 
So that, that, that those are the three main arguments. There's a few others. I, I guess I'll highlight they've also challenged the costs and the benefits piece of this rule. Any major rule like this has to have what's commonly referred to as a regulatory impact analysis or RIA. You know, in uh, layman's terms, it's cost-benefit analysis. And so they don't believe that there's enough benefits or any safety benefits to this rule and there's too many costs. So they're trying, challenging that as well. Um, the government's first response to a first brief in response uh, and, and supporting their own rule is due in about a week and a half uh, in, in later, later this month, later June. And we, ATA, will be filing an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, in support of the rule and in support of FMCSA. And we're doing that because we have supported this issue for, for a number of years now. We've supported the rulemaking when it was published. Uh, and we, we do believe it will make a difference in this industry from a compliance standpoint. Um, so the question really becomes, will the OIDA challenge delay the effective date, December 2017? Um, we don't, it, it could if OIDA wins this case, um, but we think that's a bit of a long shot. We're certainly, we, we can't predict what the court will do, and we can't predict uh, how the court will perceive OIDA's arguments. So it's certainly possible, but, but we think that's an uphill climb for OIDA. And again, we're going to do at ATA everything we can to keep this rule and its implementation on track. Um, one other thing I'll mention on, uh, in, on this topic, there is implementation guidance that FMCSA is working on, um, guidance that will be largely aimed at the law enforcement community, the CBSA officers. Uh, and, uh, but that, that guidance will matter to, to professional truck drivers and to fleets. So as soon as uh, it's issued and we have our hands on it at ATA, we'll certainly push it out to our networks both our members as well as our state trucking association affiliates and so forth. So I wanted, to, wanted you to be aware uh, of this implementation guidance because, again, while it's aimed at the law enforcement community, it will matter to truck drivers. They're going uh, to want to know what the law enforcement officers uh, are seeing from FMCSA. All right, so that's probably uh, plenty on that topic. Entry-level driver training. Uh, this is, as I think the first topic slide talked about, about a 25-year odyssey, if you will, um, back in 1991, believe it or not, Congress told uh, FMCSA's predecessor, the Office of Motor Carriers within the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, to mandate or to raise the bar for driver training for new, new people coming into the trucking industry. So in a series of fits and starts, uh, both Office of Motor Carriers and, and more recently the FMCSA has tried to put a proposed rule together uh, to raise the bar for, for driver training standards. Uh, and every start, every attempt has been met with opposition or just uh, flat out inability to implement the rule on the agency's part. Um, so with that, the eight, last year, FMCSA took a, a bit of a unique approach and they put together a negotiated rulemaking committee. This is a process that, that's used at times. It's not uh, it's not commonplace here in Washington, D.C., but, but federal agencies do use it. And in this case, they put 26 people around the table and, and said, your charge is to try to develop a proposed rule that you all can agree to. And uh, after many months of trying, the negotiated rulemaking committee actually did come up with a proposed rule. Um, and, and in terms of, of standards for the knowledge, uh, the training on the knowledge pieces as well as behind the wheel, uh, and a report was submitted by the committee to FMCSA. FMCSA then took that report and published it as a proposed rule earlier this year. As I mentioned, it, it would require this, the, these new training standards would require a certain amount of classroom training and a certain amount of behind the wheel training. And right now, as you may know, there's, there's nothing more than some classroom, about 10 hours of classroom training involved uh, pre-CDL. And this would really put in place behind the wheel training uh, that has not been in place heretofore. Uh, we ATA support this, this rule. We were a part of the uh, negotiated rulemaking committee. The only concern, really, uh, substantive concern that we have is the required behind the wheel number of hours. There's a thir minimum number of 30 hours of behind the wheel training for Class A CDL uh, applicants. Uh, and while that's certainly not a lot, it's, it's a number picked out of uh, thin air. Uh, it's, it's, it's a politically driven number, and uh, we just haven't been able to buy into that, and we don't believe the F FMCSA has much justification to, to require any number of hours, whatever the number may be. Um, having said all that, 
Um, this rule will likely be finalized this year. Uh, FMCSA is under a, a court order, a court mandate. They were sued over this issue by the, some of these anti-truck groups, and they settled that case. And, and in settling, they said that they would issue this entry-level driver training regulation by September of this year, September of 2016. Um, candidly, I don't think the agency, we don't think the agency at ATA is going to meet that. We don't think they'll miss it very far. We, we, we believe that, based on our discussions, and information that we've seen from the agency that they're targeting now December of 2016, the very end of this year. But you know, whether it's September or December, we do think it'll be finalized. Uh, and generally speaking, we think it'll be supported by this industry. Uh, again, ATA just has the concerns with the 30-hour piece. Um, that's, uh, that's about enough on that one. Uh, let's move to the safety fitness determination rule. And, uh, you know, as I did on, on uh, Gentry level driver training started with a little bit of history. Let me do that on, on this as well. Um, many of you on the call have, I'm sure, been around uh, for a number of years. If you think back when CSA was originally conceived back in the 2008-2009 time frame, and it was originally launched, as many of you recall, in 2010, the original plan by FMCSA for CSA was to have a three-legged stool, the first leg being the new scoring system, the SMS scoring system, the second leg would be and, and is uh, a new set of interventions, the way that the federal government and the state governments in using the scoring system would, would oversee and enforce uh, the rules. Uh, so, that, so the scoring system, a new set of interventions, and the third leg of the stool was to use CSA as the, the new safety rating methodology, the new safety rating tool, if you will. Um, and that was planned. And so this whole process, the safety fitness termination process, was supposed to start back in 2008, 2009. It literally has been delayed uh, for about eight years now for any number of reasons. Uh, and and I, would, I would tell you that one of the big reasons is because of all of the industry concern and pushback over the scoring system, the SMS, and all of the flaws and, and, and problems with the SMS system. Having said that, it's a lot better than it used to be. It's a lot better than its, its predecessor, uh, SafeStat, but it still isn't quite good enough uh, to be publicly available, and that's why the, the scores are no longer there. But it's not good enough in ATA's view and many other uh, uh, people's view to use it as a mechanism to determine who is fit or unfit to operate in our industry. Um, the Safety Fitness Termination Proposal was published in January of this year. Um, it did have uh, some failing standards. In other words, if two basics, two uh, behavioral safety improvement categories were, uh, if they crossed this failure standard, in other words, over a certain high threshold, the carrier would be uh, proposed as unfit. Um, and in, in proposing this rule, FMCSA said that only about 300 carriers would cross into this unfit category using the CSA methodology. Um, Congress, in late December, when they passed the FAST Act, the latest highway bill, uh, required that the, the percentile scores be taken off the website. Congress also required that the CSA data and methodology undergo yet another study, and a study, an independent study by the National Academy of Sciences. And in doing that, um, we believe at ATA and many others believe that Congress was saying, don't move forward on the safety fitness determination rule. Yet they did. Uh, the agency did. And some in Congress more recently since the FAST Act was passed have really weighed in at the over at FMCSA and DOT level saying that this is, this is really uh, thumbing the, the agency's nose at Congress. Um, so as I put on the slide, some in Congress get the fact that CSA has a lot of problems and should not be used uh, to rate carriers. So the comment period ended wasn't uh, this week. It was last week, I believe. Um, and there, there is a whole lot of opposition in the docket, us included, but many, many fleets and many, many other organizations have opposed a CSA-based safety fitness rule. And more recently, and here's the news that I mentioned earlier, alluded to earlier, and I think many of you will find it good news, um, FMCSA did respond to some congressional inquiries recently. In late May, they sent a letter, the agency did, to Congress uh, and saying that they would not move forward with this regulation until the National Academy of Sciences study is done, until um, you know, the improvements are identified and, and perhaps fully implemented. Um, and so it, it will be, the NAS study was, uh, is supposed to be, take about 18 months. 
Uh, so it will be at least a year and a half to two years before this final rule moves forward. So if you're concerned at all about CSA being used as a tool to, to determine safety ratings, uh, breathe a little easier because FMCSA is not moving forward, at least at this point. Okay, um, let's shift to the drug and alcohol clearinghouse rule. Um, just as I did with the last two, there's a long history to this one. I won't bore you with a lot of details, but this one's been around since 1999 when Congress asked uh, DOT and FMCSA to take a hard look at the feasibility and the costs of implementing a clearinghouse. That study was done in 04-05 timeframe, and, and DOT clearly identified that a clearinghouse was feasible and it was probably desirable and it could be done at a somewhat reasonable cost. Um, with, with all that as background, it literally took uh, uh, FMCSA about 10 years to move from the study to a proposed rule in 2015. And the proposal was a good proposal. I mean, it's, it's fairly comprehensive, but it's, it was not proposed as a complete solution. And what do we mean by that? We mean that um, most uh, of the violations of Part 382, the drug and alcohol testing regulations, under the proposal would have to be reported into the clearinghouse and then would have to be checked by uh, uh, future employers if somebody is, uh, if they're considering hiring somebody as a professional driver. Um, so, it, so the proposal included a number of violations, employer inquiries into the clearinghouse, some anticipated costs, and so forth. What it did not do, it did not include direct observations. So if a supervisor of a trucking company directly observed a driver uh, ingesting illegal substances or ingesting alcohol while on duty, or if there was an omission of misuse by the driver himself uh, while on duty, uh, those two violations of Part 382 were not proposed to go into the clearinghouse. That's a problem. That's a problem uh, for us and that's a problem for this industry because number one, that's not what's intended here and Congress didn't intend for this to be a partial solution. They intended to be a one-stop shop of all past violations of Part 382 and, and the language in the law is clear to that effect. Uh, but also what that would mean for fleets is that you would have to ping in the future the clearinghouse for, again, the, the testing positive results that might be in the clearinghouse but then you'd have to go back to previous employers for any asking whether they had any direct observations or any emissions of misuse. So there would be this bifurcated screening process, which in our view is just crazy, and it adds a whole bunch of hassle, some cost to this process, and it's not what was intended by the industry or ATA when, when we were uh, promoting this. So we've aggressively advocated for the complete solution, not this partial deal. And I will tell you, we went to uh, OMB just yesterday and the rule is undergoing its final review at the Office of Management Budget. That, that's what OMB stands for. That's a part of the White House that does sort of the last check of major regulations before they're published. And there's an opportunity to go in and sit with those folks who are doing the final review. We did that, and we pushed for this complete solution. We pushed for a subscription-based cost model, and we pushed for uh, make, trying to make sure that third parties like HireRight have access into the clearinghouse uh, in support of the industry. Um, so we continue to work and advocate for this, and, and I, I'm, I and we at ATA are cautiously optimistic that FMCSA may see the light and actually change the proposed rule into a final rule that would make it a complete solution, a one-stop shop, as I mentioned. Okay, enough about that. Um, a couple of things, uh, the, the next rule is, uh, there's, there's two rules here from the Department of Labor. One is the OSHA. Recent Injury and Illness Record-Keeping Rule, and the next slide I'll talk about the Department of Labor's Overtime Rule. Uh, for many, many years, as, as you know, OSHA has required reporting, I'm sorry, um, capturing of uh, injuries and illnesses on their forms, right, on Form 300 and the Form 300A with the summary, and then there's an incident report form with th uh, Form 301. Um, more recently, OSHA has decided that they are going to put in electronic form um, a reporting requirement. So employers, and again, this is not just aimed at the trucking industry, of course. This is aimed at all employers, which is why we're using that term. And they've bifurcated under this new regulation um, the, the electronic reporting requirements, meaning that employers with more than 200, uh, 250 or more employees have to submit electronically forms 300, 300A, and 301 annually. Um, and they have to first do that uh, by July 1st of next year, 
Uh, and then come 2018, uh, it has to be July 1st of 2018, all, all those forms need to be submitted. And then starting in 2019, that, that uh, date moves back to March. By March 1st of 2019, all those forms need to be electronically submitted to OSHA through a secure website which is not yet developed. Um, and, and OSHA will then turn that into a searchable database for the public. This is not unlike the CSA approach over at DOT. Um, and the bifurcated approach continuing with that, employers with 20 but less than 250 employees in certain industries, and trucking is covered here, they have to submit the, 300, uh, the form 300A, that's the summary form annually. And again, the, these reporting dates uh, apply to both. The reporting begins July of 2017, uh, for the big and smaller uh, employers, and all the employers have to file the 300A by that time, and then the large employers by July of 2018 have to file the 300, the 301, uh, and the 300A. So th this this is moving, uh, you know, sort of the, the the process into the electronic world. This is clearly a nudge by Department of Labor and by OSHA a nudge towards safer workplaces by making this, uh, this data publicly available. So you're going to have to report it through a secure website, again, which is not yet developed. And once it's reported, OSHA will make it publicly available on their website and searchable by anybody in the public who chooses to do so. Uh, there is some concern, as you might imagine, in the employer community. Uh, there was certainly some concern on our part at ATA about this, this certainly uh, looks like and feels like OSHA's version of CSA, and given all our CSA experience at DOT and FMCSA, uh, we were very skeptical of this approach. But the fact of the matter is the rules there, the deadlines are there, and, and unless somebody successfully challenges it, it will, it will continue to move forward. Okay, let's uh, move into the last specific issue here, um, <clears throat> the Department of Labor's overtime rule. And again, similar to OSHA's rule, this is not trucking specific. Uh, it applies broadly to the business community, and the, the Department of Labor changed its, its rules governing the salary test for the white-collar exemption. The white-collar exemption is, is really for executive uh, personnel, administrative personnel, or other professional personnel that meet a duties test, that have um, you know, some, uh, I guess, uh, flexibility and autonomy to make decisions in helping to run the operations of the business, that's the duties, and then the salary test was 23,660, and that, that salary level was in place since 2004. This recent rule increased it to $47,476. So, <coughs> excuse me, as you, as you can see, that's about a 100% increase. Um, so it, it took a significant jump up on the salary level. The duties test itself was not changed, but what was changed that bonus is now up to 10% of the threshold, up to 10% of the 47,000, <coughs> excuse me, um, can now be uh, included in the salary level, whereas that was not the case before. Um, the, the one thing to, to mention here, uh, this rule will apply differently throughout the country. I suspect many trucking companies um, whose operations personnel, dispatch personnel, uh, perhaps in the Northeast or the Upper Midwest, they probably meet the, the salary level. Perhaps in the South uh, or other parts of the country, maybe maybe dispatch and operations personnel don't meet this 47,400 test. But the point is that it, it, this is not going to apply uniformly throughout the industry. It's really going to be up to the employer to determine, uh, do my people meet the duties test and they do they meet the salary level test? If not, then that person's going to have to drop back into either an hourly wage or if they stay on salary, they're going to have to be paid overtime uh, beyond the 40 hours even if they're salaried. Um, something to, to keep in mind, this rule does not affect drivers. This is not a driver-specific rule. In fact, drivers have a separate overtime exemption under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Any professional driver that's regulated by the U.S. Department of Transportation's hours of service rules uh, is, is exempt from the overtime piece. Uh, under the FLSA. So this is really, again, aimed at broader business community, but in trucking industry, it largely could affect if the person doesn't meet this new salary level. It affects uh, probably operations personnel and dispatch personnel. So just wanted to be very clear on, on the distinction between drivers and dispatch folks. All right, uh, had not intended to, to cover these three issues in any great length, but I'll just throw them up. Uh, 
uh, and, and just mention them. There is a significant EPA and NHTSA regulation coming uh, later this summer, early fall, uh, and it's the Phase Two fuel economy standards. I'm not going to go into great detail, but it'll, it'll be aimed at the uh, OEMs, the truck and trailer original equipment manufacturers, uh, but it'll clearly affect trucking fleets from a specking equipment standpoint. Uh, DOT has been working on a speed limiter proposed rule for many years now, and uh, that's been over at the White House Office of Man Management and Budget for many, many months, and they've obviously hit a snag, and it really is anybody's guess of whether this is going to be published this year. Our guess at ATA is it probably will be published, but it probably will not be finalized uh, anytime and soon, uh, given that there will be a change in administrations. And then the sleep apnea issue. This has been around for many years, as, as you know, uh, and DOT and FMCSA have put it on what I describe as sort of the slow boat to China approach, this advanced rulemaking approach. Um, what the, the comment period was supposed to close last week uh, to the series of questions that FMCSA asked. They have now extended it another 30 days into ju July. Uh, so the, the, any sleep apnea rule is quite a ways off because it from an ANPRM process, and then it has to go through the proposed rulemaking and final rule stage and so forth. So that's, it's literally many years off. So I, I, I didn't want to uh, dwell on any of these three, but I did want to mention them in case there are questions, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions along those lines. So that, that really uh, um, ends my prepared remarks and, and the prepared slides, and uh, I, I'm happy to try to go through the questions if there are some at this point, Tommy. and. Uh, and I know, Tommy, I think you're going to come back on the line, and if there are questions, perhaps read them uh, to me, and I'll try to answer them. So again, thanks for dialing in. I hope uh, this information was was useful, uh, and more than happy to try to answer any questions if there are some. Tommy. Yeah. So thanks, Dave. There there are a few questions that came through, and if if anyone else out on the line has any questions that they'd like to ask, they can you know hit the Q and A um, at the bottom of the screen in your toolbar. So, uh, excuse me, Dave, one of the questions that um, came up in regards to entry-level driver training, you said earlier um, 30 hours behind the wheel for a Class CDA. <clears throat> what might it be if it was a Class B? Is it the same? No, it's, it's actually less, and I'm, and I'm drawing from memory. I don't have the summary right in front of me, but I believe it's uh, – and don't hold me to this. I, I believe it's 15 for Class B, but but again, I I'd have to go back and look at the summary, and that's one of the ones that we'll have to follow up. Uh, but there are differences between the classes on the behind the wheel training. Uh, I'll just have to consult the the actual documents because I don't re re recall off the top of my head. Okay, there's another question here. It says, uh, our drivers operate vehicles that currently do not require a CDL to operate. Are these employers exempt from this new requirement? On the uh, entry-level driver training? I believe that was for the electronic uh, logging devices. Okay. Um, and it, the, the answer is they could be um, because the electronic logging device rule applies to trucks that are over 10,001 pounds. And there is, uh, th this is sort of a distinction between um, CDLs and, and non-CDL drivers who still drive trucks that are regulated by the DOT. So, so I'm trying to make this simple. I'm going to take it out of the CDL world and put it into the size of the truck. If the truck is over 10,001 pounds GVWR and the driver has to fill out a paper logbook under today's rules, then the answer is yes, um, drivers would need ELDs. Um, if the driver operates a truck over 10,001, but doesn't have to fill out a paper logbook, then the answer is no. So it really depends uh, on the type of operation, and it depends on the size of the truck being operated. But but CDL is not the determining factor in the ELD rule. It's really the, the size and the, the age of the truck on the one hand, and whether the driver is required to fill out a paper logbook on the other hand. I hope that makes sense. Okay, and you touched there at the end a little bit on sleep apnea. There's a question here in regards to the sleep apnea rule. Am I, am I to understand at this point there can't be any enforcement of the rule at this time? Well, again, um, there, there 
is no clear defined sleep apnea rule specifically. There is a, an existing medical standard um, on respiratory functions of a driver, and that's, that's where the gray area comes in. Uh, because there is a respiratory standard, um, and because sleep apnea is a respiratory problem um, that could create daytime sleepiness and fatigue, if a medical examiner determines that a driver has some risk factors um, and directs some type of uh, sleep test, whether that be sort of a portable take-home test or an actual in-lab test, um, there, there could be not only the, the requirement for the test, but there could be some enforcement if the doctor determines that the person has sleep apnea and needs some treatment and the, the driver doesn't follow the treatment plan and still drives. So um, this is not a black and white scenario. There is very much gray given this existing respiratory standard and the obligation of the certified medical examiner to investigate uh, any, vi any problems that a driver may have in meeting that standard. So um, I, I know that that's not a terribly helpful answer, but that just is the current reality. But it's also one of the reasons why this industry, our trucking industry, needs a very clear black and white sleep apnea rule. Um, we, we need to get out of this gray area and we need to know exactly, you know, what the standards are for sleep apnea, what are the, the risk factors that the medical examiner will, uh, is required to properly evaluate, and when does the driver have to go get a sleep test, whether that be in lab or a take home. So all of that is a bit gray. Uh, we need a rule, but as I mentioned, we're not going to get a rule anytime soon given the, the regulatory uh, path that this is on right now. Okay, so Dave, there's another question here in regards to electronic logging devices. Uh, it says, will a driver working for multiple motor carriers be required to input his or her previous seven days of logs <clears throat> into the ELD each time he or she works for a different motor carrier, or will paper copies of the previous seven days be sufficient for a seven-day statement? Yeah, um, so this is <laughs> this is when I uh, wish that Rob Abbott was sitting here next to me because he would know this off the top of his head, and I'm going to have to dig into the rule without him. But um, I, I believe, and, and again, we will follow up with this person in, in writing based on this question, um, but I believe that a, a, a seven-day statement uh, may suffice under the final rule. Uh, I think obviously there will be different systems in the market, uh, there's there's going to be some interoperability between these systems, but I do believe the rule allows the, the paper-based uh, seven-day synopsis. Uh, but again, that's subject to sort of going back and confirming, um, and, and I sure wish Rob could, was here because he'd know it off the top of his head, but that's a good question. We'll follow up. Okay. Um, a few more questions here. All right, so another one in regard to um, the ELD. So what would a driver show law enforcement if the driver ex is exempt from ELD due to the air mile radius exemption? Their time card may be at a terminal. Would they have to demonstrate that are, they are not required to have an ELD? No, they're not going to have to demonstrate, but they will have to be able to communicate, you know, pretty clearly and effectively that they're not subject to the ELD requirement on that particular day on that particular trip and that they're subject to the, the time card requirement in, in uh, Part 395. So there's, there's no uh, affirmative demonstration requirement that the driver is exempt from ELDs, but uh, it would behoove companies and drivers to make sure they all know uh, why they're not subject to the ELD requirement on that particular day and that particular trip. So that, that's a very good question, um, and historically that's, that's been the same with paper logs, right? If a driver doesn't have a paper log because he's subject to the 100 air mile radius uh, exemption or he's taking advantage of that, he really doesn't have to be able to show the law enforcement officer or anything, but he, 
to, to avoid a problem, he should be able to explain it. And the same is same will be true under the ELD rule. Okay, and there seems to be a lot of questions around ELD, so another one uh, on that topic. If a driver's truck is older than the year 2000, will he or she be required to do logs on a smart device, just not linked to a full ELD system? Boy, I don't, I don't believe so. I think the answer to that is, is no, um, because there is no, there's no sort of hybrid approach here. Um, I, I view that question as sort of a hybrid approach with a tablet or some software version of, of logs that are not uh, linked to the truck, and there is no such thing in the final rule. It's either the truck is truck and driver are required to have it or they're not. Um, and, and if they're not, then they're subject to some other uh, record keeping requirement for logs uh, for for hours of service compliance. So uh, that that is not the case in the final rule. Okay, so another question in regards to entry level driver training: Is there any specific classroom syllabus and number of hours required for the knowledge portion of entry level training? Um, there, in terms of the syllabus, there are the the short answer to that is yes. There are sort of knowledge categories or, or modules or areas of, of training that have to be covered. That is a part of the rule, um, and I, I don't believe there are any hours requirements for the classroom. I think it's all just uh, sort of performance based, if you will. That that has to be the uh, training syllabus or uh, Training categories have to be covered by the training institution, um, and I didn't talk about this, but there ha there does have to be a certification by the training institution, whether that's a truck driver training school, you know, sort of a for-profit school, or whether that's a community college, or whether that's even a trucking company that is training its own drivers. There has to be a certification that they're meeting the standards, uh, and it will be a self-certification process, uh, at least initially. So uh, I know I, I wandered off away from the direct question a little bit towards the end there, but no, I don't believe there's minimum number of hours for the classroom, but there clearly are some specific training areas that have to be covered and addressed. Okay, another question here. Is there any proposed changes that you're aware of being thrown around for the 16-hour exemption rule? Short answer is no. Um, there's there's nothing that that I'm aware of, we're aware of in the in the regulatory process to change that rule, um, and there's certainly nothing going on in Congress right now. Uh, the only thing hours of service related in Congress is the restart um, fix that we and others are trying to make sure happens. But uh, but no, there's nothing specific to change the existing 16-hour rule. Okay. Are you getting near the end of the question list, or do you have more, Tommy? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple more here. Um, this is kind of going back to the overtime rule. <clears throat> if I have a dispatcher that I pay $50,000 a year and is on call 24-7, do I need to pay him overtime? No. The short answer is no. He's, he's assuming he meets the duties test. Um, and you do have to know what the duties test is and, and make sure you analyze his duties and compare them with the test. Um, but he, he, he obviously in this say, uh, question and scenario meets the salary test at 50000 um, So if he meets the duties test and he meets the salary level, which he does, he is not subject to uh, overtime. He can, he can take, uh, the company can take advantage of the exemption, the white collar exemption. Okay. And we and, and and this is a, a bit of an aside, but we actually asked the Department of Labor, we ATA asked them to include in a list of examples of the types of jobs that are that are white collar that would meet the uh, professional white collar exemption if they met the the salary level. And we asked that dispatchers and, and trucking operations personnel be included. Unfortunately, the Department of Labor chose not to do that. Um, too many industries asked for sort of their people to be on the list. So they, instead of granting all the requests, they simply denied all the requests, and that's unfortunate. 
Okay, so Dave, is there anything that you're aware of upcoming from the FMCSA about personal conveyance? Yeah, I, um, I, I do believe, uh, and again, I, I uh, wish my friend Rob were with me, but uh, I do believe that this personal conveyance issue um, will be addressed in this implementation guidance that I mentioned uh, in my prepared remarks. I think not only are drivers and companies, but law enforcement is going to need to know, you know, how far can that truck be used uh, as a as a personal vehicle uh, when the driver's off duty. And I think that that's, that will be part of that. Um, at least that's what Rob has indicated to me in the recent past. Okay. Um, another one here. Are motor coach drivers required to take 34 hours off for a reset for 70 hours? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to beg off on the motor coach question. I don't know the motor coach hours of service rules. They, they are different from the trucking hours of service rules. Um, I, I, I don't believe motor coach operators uh, are can take advantage of the restart, but, but I, I don't know because we're, we're obviously trucking specific here at the ATA and, and we don't get into the motor coach side of the rules. Okay. I mean, if if need be, we can certainly do some some quick homework on that. But I, I'm reluctant to answer it off the top of my because I simply don't know. Um. Okay. Uh, so, a couple more questions here. Um, we use paper logs to stay in 100 miles, work less than 12 hours, and park and leave from the same place <clears throat> daily. Um, we don't use the time sheets or time cards. Would our drivers still need ELDs? It sure doesn't sound like you would need ELDs. It sounds like you're using paper logs out of your choice because it sounds like, based on the scenario here, within 12 hours, leaving and returning to the same location, um, uh, and I forget what the third thing you mentioned, but uh, it's, it sounds like you're subject to the exemption. You're, you can take the uh, logbook exemption, but you're choosing not to use time cards. You're choosing to use the, a, a paper log for whatever reason, uh, and that's certainly okay. But that doesn't force a driver into or a company into using ELDs. It's only... Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. That's that's based on the scenario. It doesn't sound like to me ELDs would be required. Okay. So, in regards to OSHA e-record keeping, <clears throat> do you know how this will affect a company with less than 20 employees but has a fleet of owner operators? Uh, for the purposes of um, OSHA, I, 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 if it's less than 20 employees plus owner-operators, and again, subject to confirmation, um, I believe they're going to treat those owner-operators as employees in this context uh, when, when operating for the company under the company's authority. Um, again, subject to confirmation on that one. Uh, but generally speaking, let me say that anybody, any company with less than 20 um, is, is not subject to this new electronic record-keeping rule. It's, it's, you know, you have to pierce that, that, that 20 number, but obviously the question here is combination of employees and independent contractors. And I believe for this purpose the independent contractors would be counted. Now keep in, keep in mind that this, you know, this rule is relatively new, correct? It's, it was issued in May, just about a month ago, uh, and there, there is still some... Uh, you know, fleshing out for some of the details, but and that, this is this may be one of them, and we can look into that afterward. But again, I I believe they would be counted. Okay. Um,
so maybe one last question here, Dave. So it says, when a driver of a 10,000, so a GVW of over 10,000 pound truck runs overweight, they become subject to DOT drug testing. Will the same apply to ELDs? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. Um, drug drug testing is tied to, and and this is different than um, the scenario earlier with ELDs and the size of the truck and CDLs. Drug testing and CDL is, are tied together. In other words, if you have a CDL, you're subject to drug testing. Um, if you, if you don't have a CDL and you operate a smaller truck, just because the truck is over 10,001 pounds doesn't mean um, you're subject in this case. So, but again, I'm not sure I, I entirely understand this question. If you, can you run it by me one more time, Tommy, and let me see if I better understand it the second time around. Oh, and I apologize, Dave. I just uh, just went off my screen. Uh, but it's one it's one maybe we can follow up on and, and send out um, at the conclusion of this call. Yeah, see, and, and it was, well, okay. Yeah, but CDL and drug testing are linked together, and, and drug testing is not tied to the size of the truck um, for the most part. I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, but, but that's the general rule here. Okay, question just uh, in regards to sleep apnea. Who is going to be responsible for the cost of the test and machines for sleep apnea? Uh, right now the answer is uh, there, there is no requirement. There is no definitive answer to that. Um, and even in some future scenario where there is a rule, uh, I would be surprised if that answer was, was definitive. In other words, um, FMCSA has historically allowed the uh, the payment of, of DOT exams and any follow-up testing and exams to be really subject to negotiation between the employee and the employer. Uh, so that's has historically been treated as a labor management issue by the U.S. Department of Transportation and FMCSA. I would not be surprised if that's where sleep apnea ended up. But again, there's no rule in place. There's nothing today that says the employer is responsible or the driver is responsible. It's really up to the employer and the driver to figure it out. And uh, some future rule may change that, but I doubt it. Okay. So, Dave, thank you very much. That um, looks like most of the questions that have come across. Um, so we want to thank everybody for attending today's presentation. Thank you again, Dave, very much for uh, your support and joining the call. Um, <clears throat> one last note, if there's anybody or you know, at the conclusion of this call, we would love for you to take a minute to fill out a short survey at the end of the call. Uh, we appreciate your feedback for any future calls that we have or topics that you would like to hear about. So thank you again for joining, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.